you hear me? I can hear you clear. Oh, great. Okay, let, let me just connect my um, my headphones. For some reason, they were not working. That's funny. Um, can you speak? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm here. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Perfect. Great. Beautiful. Yes, yes, I can hear you. There seems to be some delay. Let me let me disconnect any VPN that I have uh, that I may have connected. Um, so you are taunting me with a nice Miami life. I love it. Yeah, so, sorry about that. <laughs> That's usually the comment that I get whenever I do a, a video call from from a, what I call my home office, which is basically my backyard. Um, all Are you around. in Kendall? Yes, I live in, in, in West Kendall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're familiar with the area, obviously. Very familiar. My dad yeah. had a plant in Hialeah. I worked at Lincoln Road Mall for years. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, no, I live farther west, farther south in, in the crossings, um, around 120 or something like that, which is far from the university, but it's, you know, it's still affordable. There are good restaurants, you know, cinema theaters, bookstores. So it's, so it's like, I mean, we barely leave the neighborhood. We barely go to the civilized part of Miami, <laughs> downtown <laughs> or, <laughs> or Brick Hill or places like that. We barely go there. Well, you, you've crafted an interesting life to be a journalist, a data person, and work in a university. Yeah, yeah, it was, uh, yeah, I, I went through many, many career changes. I'm, I, I still consider myself a practitioner, but I stumbled upon teaching 14 or 15 years ago or something like that. I really liked it. And fortunately, at all institutions where I taught, both the University of Miami and UNC Chapel Hill, the administration was work the both administrations were kind enough to allow me to basically have two full-time jobs one of them as a teacher and another one as a professional so i still do a lot of consulting and freelancing and things like that because i'm i'm not a researcher by any means although i am involved in several research projects i am more like i'm more a teacher i'm educate i'm an educator and, and i still want to have my hands hands dirty whenever it is possible doing stuff for clients so yeah so did you come from the data world or did you come from journalism? Oh, I come from journalism. I, am a, I have a degree in journalism. I began my career as a journalist in Spain. I was a manager uh, in Spain and in Brazil of, of graphics teams. Um, so making infographics, basically, visual representations of information. Yeah, for, for more than a decade. Yeah, so I, yeah. But then I was offered these positions in academia to, to teach the craft, and that's how I... I ended up here in 2012. I appreciate you taking the time. I'll, I'll try not to take too much of your time. Oh yeah, sure. I mean, I'm, I, today is my, my day to work at home, so I have a very flexible schedule. Well, I come from the medical world and I, I review science and um, medical, medical books. Okay. Uh -huh. and that's my therapy. Well, I, I, I come from a healthcare family. My entire, I'm the only black sheep in the family because really? my entire family works in healthcare. My dad is a doctor. My mom, before she retired, was a, uh, the head of nursing in a big hospital in Spain. And my uncle, my aunt, my grandfather, everybody works in healthcare. So, yeah, my dad is a doctor. He was both a researcher before he retired, both a researcher, a teacher, and also a practitioner. Yeah. Very nice. So, so my goal is really to bring people who think scientifically mm -hmm to the book people in DC who are very heavily political. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and having mm -hmm. read your book, you are very heavy, very heavily politically minded. I am, yes. Uh -huh. A lot of the- I am, I am, I am, I do, the way that I usually put it in talks is that I am extremely political, but I am very nonpartisan. Um, although I have very strong opinions about certain things that this country is going through, particularly recently. In the past few years, I try to keep those opinions to myself, particularly when it comes to write seriously about topics like graphics. I try to be as fair-minded as possible. So I consider that everything that we do as public, public intellectuals, so to speak, is political. You're participating in the political conversation. You cannot avoid that. And it really drives me crazy when people say, oh, I'm non-political. Or yeah. why are you so political? Well, you cannot avoid being political if you're part of the public conversation. You are political because you're a participant in a conversation about the policy, the polity, right? 
So you need to be political. What you can do is non we can do try not to be is nonpartisan. So even if I am extremely anti Trump, that doesn't mean that I'm extremely anti GOP anti GOP. Those are two completely different things. You can be anti Trump without being anti conservative. So I'm extremely nonpartisan in that sense. So in the book you you very clearly focus focus and say here's the issue. So it's it's not a partisan issue, it's here's a map they're sharing that doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. Data on the stock market that really is misinterpreted. And that, that's why I repeat so many times in the book, as you may have noticed, and also in talks, is like regardless of what you think about this topic, I mean, I touch into, touch into upon very, very touchy issues such as abortion or, or race, et cetera, et cetera. In, in the abortion case, in that, that chart that was used in Congress, to attack Planned Parenthood, I, I explicitly say in the book, I don't care what you think about abortion. That's completely besides the point. Regardless of whether you want to attack Planned Parenthood or defend Planned Parenthood, this chart is subjectively bad. It's a bad chart. So you need to do better, regardless of what your argument is. It's subjectively a bad chart. You have 900,000 below 300,000. Say, look, it's dropped below. <laughs> it's absurd. It's like it's so obviously badly designed for many reasons, not only because it distorts the data by using two different actors, but also because it conceals very important context that is essential to understanding what Planned Parenthood does or doesn't do. Right? It's like if you, have, if, you want, if you want to have that discussion, again, regardless of what your partisan position is, you need a better graphic. I don't care where you come from, but you do need, that, you need to use a better graphic if you want to have a conversation. Because one of the things that I cannot stand is propagandists. And that chart is an example. Propagandist, propaganda. That chart is propaganda, right? It's like I cannot stand propaganda. I, I, I like information. Regardless of what the political position is, I follow people from all over the political spectrum. But when I notice it, that someone is engaging in propaganda and not in a fair minded conversation about relevant issues, that's when I become, that's when I become upset. That's when, when I, I really, really become upset. And where do you share your information? I'm sorry? Where do you share your information? Well, I am all over. I'm, I'm on Twitter. I'm very active on Twitter, very active in social media. Twitter is my main platform to publish stuff. But I also have a, I also have a web blog. Uh, in, I try to update it every, publish something every week or every week and a half, something like that. The, the, the web blog is the, um, the title of my first book in the U.S. market, The Functional Art. So it's thefunctionalart.com. That's my web blog. Right. So whenever I have something to say that is short enough, I put it on Twitter. If I need to write longer, then I put it on the blog. Interesting. Mm -hmm. It was also nice to see you took the information and visuals back to Florence Nightingale. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was shocked that she came up with such a nice visual and such a creative one. Yes, well, that's her, more, her most famous graphic. She has many, many others. Uh, that, that graphic that became very, very famous in the 19th century and is considered a landmark in the history of visual communication, that's at the, the very end of a very long process in which she collected data, she analyzed the data with the help of several statisticians at the time. Um, she realized that some of the actions that she had taken when she was at the hospitals in Turkey were not the right actions because she focused too much on, on basically a cleaning up air rather than cleaning up the spaces, right? particularly under the underground of those space, uh, spaces. And she basically created a whole campaign to change the treatment of soldiers by the British, by the British Army. So she's, she was a true hero in the history of, she is a true hero in the history of um, uh, nursing uh, she's also a true hero in the in the in the history of public health care, uh, uh, and but she's also a true hero in the in the world of data analysis and visual communication. Just because she showed how you could use graphics effectively, not only to inform but also to persuade, to create graphics that are visually striking at the same time that they are depicting the information. So she is, in my opinion, one of the most well-rounded figures in the history of in the history of visualization. And that was a critical point, saying that she had an audience of one, and that she wanted to persuade her boss to make the change, mm -hmm. not to inform the masses. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah, or an audience of one, or an audience of just a few people, the, the people who had the power to make changes, the queen and people in the army, uh, to make the changes that were needed. And there are many, many historical figures 
that are uh, extremely relevant to the world of different fields that basically intertwine or overlap. So one of them is um, a nightingale, but another one will be John Snow from the 19th century, the famous cholera map from the 19th century. That, that's a critical, it's a critical piece in the history of uh, epidemiology uh, because he sort of corroborated the connection between water consumption tainted water consumption and cholera spread, when at the time doctors believed that it was, it was the miasmatic theory, right? People believed that cholera got transmitted by breathing stinky air, right? But, but Snow basically was, um, through observation, etc. He he was convinced that it was the water, it was not the air that was transmitting cholera. And he did a lot of work, and his most famous piece of work is a map published around 1860-something, uh, in which he showed the outbreak and the number of cases, people who have died of cholera, and then the connection between the position of those deaths and and, and water and water pumps. Right? So it's, it's a very interesting piece of work. Yeah. And I think another difference is that now our visuals are meant to engage readers rather than enlighten them. That we use visual visuals to get people to click to open up. Yeah. Well, I, I discuss that quite, that quite a lot in my in my other books. How to size a book for the general public, but the books that I that I wrote before were aimed mostly at communicators, statisticians, data scientists, data journalists, and stuff like that. So I engage I mean, in you know explaining the balance that we all need to achieve between engagement, clarity, you know, enlightenment, and things like that. And I say that you know the perfect visualization is the one that can achieve everything that engages you in some way, but then it's able to deliver the information. And in the previous books, I described several strategies that communicators can use to both engage the reader and bring the reader into the information, but at the same time, providing the information in an accurate manner and in a, in a deep enough manner. Because sometimes what we journalists tend to do, and it's a warning that I, that I say mentioned explicitly in my previous books, is that we journalists tend to uh, oversimplify information, right? We tend to get rid of very relevant context and very relevant depth. So that's something that I warn against in the book, or striking the right balance between, again, engagement, clarity, but and depth at the same time, depth of information. But I think that you can achieve both. One of the things I struggle with is that we're all looking for companies to take our data to turn into visuals. Mm. Um, so we have a lot of data on medical students that you know, we, we say make it tall, um, connect the multiple databases so you get a visual. Mm. And there are very few companies that do that. So a lot of the data is really being funneled through similar lenses, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, which is nice, but it's also uncomfortable. It is uncomfortable because may, it may introduce certain biases in the data, right? I'm not an expert in, in, in data creation and, and data, data gathering. I have friends who work in that area and they have similar concerns in other in other disciplines, the fact that there may be just one or two sources for data for a specific for a specific topics, right? Real estate market, for example, or it, it would be another another example, right? There may be there may be just two or three big actors in each market that provide that sort of data, and that that's risky, right? It's like that's the journalism journalistic mind speaking in this sense that when you do, you only have one source. And you know, you cannot corroborate or verify the information with other sources. That's when you need to be nervous about the information that you're working with. Do you think that the general public will become better um, purchasers of information or evaluators? I think so. I'm I'm a, I'm a great optimist. And uh, there is a case. All right. So um, there is a there is a graphic that I describe in the in the preface in the introduction to the book. Um, it's a scatter plot that was designed by the Pew Research Center, asking people, it's in the first few, few pages of How Chuck's Life. So I don't have the book with me right now, but it, it's in the first few pages. So it's a scatter plot showing the association between sugar consumption per capita and average number of decay teeth, right? So the Pew Research Center uh, inserted that chart into a survey asking a sample of 1,000 people several questions about science. And one of them was, how do you read this chart, right? It's like, at the grammatical level, it's like, what does it mean that dots are on the, on the horizontal axis? What does it mean that dots are on the vertical axis, right? And they discovered that only, and I will put quotation marks around that only, 
only 67% of Americans in that sample could read the graphic at that very basic grammatical level. Well, whenever I, I show this example in talks, I usually say, well, this is both, that, that one, that one. So this is both bad news and good news. Well, it is bad news because obviously one third of people in this sample could not read a scatter plot. A, at the grammatical level. I mean, they didn't understand that the position on one axis means something, position on another axis means something. They could not read that graphic even at that level. That's worrying. But at the same time, I think that is also a very good sign that 67% of people could read the graphic at this grammatical level. Because I can assure you that uh, if I could conduct this, if we could conduct that same survey when I began my career 20 years ago, that percentage of people who can read that graphic will be much lower. Just because the scatter plots were nowhere to be seen in, in news media, but it's scatter plots today. You can see them in the Washington Post, and in the, so sort of like the sophistication, the graphicacy of readers in general, but at least readers who are exposed to good sources of information, has increased, and that 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 shows that you know there's progress. Yeah, people are, for example, how many people you hear today, you know, repeating the mantra, correlation is not causation. Obviously, there's a lot of qualifiers because correlation is usually one of the first sources to establish cultural connections but so but but the the fact that people are repeating that and internalizing that and being a little bit more skeptical about claims that 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 talk about correlation that's progress that shows that there has been an improvement in the sophistication that readers apply to uh, to approaching this information there is a still a long a long way to go i think there is a we need to go way beyond correlation is not causation that that's too basic right but still it's much more sophisticated than 20 years ago when people did establish correlation, uh, sorry, causation based on just mere correlation, most people at least. It is a recognition that that has to matter. And I think you brought up scaffolding. Mm -hmm. um, when you start looking at a chart, you read it in a systematic manner. Mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. reinforced to me what we do with x-rays. You mm -hmm. never read an x-ray until you know who the x-ray is, uh, is from. My dad, my I saw my dad reading X-rays. That's I find so funny that you included that in the questions because it is true. There is like a process that, that you need to follow to read an X-ray. Right? It's like the same. It, it's it that's connected to to the case that I tried to build in the book that graphics are not images. They are images, but they should not be they should not be approached just as mere illustrations or photographs. They are visual arguments. Right? Arguments that you build in your brain with the help of the graphic, right? in the interaction between your brain and the graphic. That argument is like, it's like a textual argument. You need to pay attention to the graphic and read it in a more systematic manner. Just, not just merely looking at it, but actually focusing on the things that matter and see the connections, see the relationships between the scaffolding and the encodings and asking yourself questions based on all that. It's a process that requires attention. That's the reason why I put so much emphasis on the attention factor in the books. I, 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 if there is a, a, a one takeaway that I would like readers for, of the book to, to take from the book, it's like pay attention. Stop. <laughs> when you when you read a chart, don't take for granted. Don't take it for granted. Don't take it at face value just by looking looking at look, looking at it. Stop for a few seconds and read it. The same way that you will read a news story in order to decode it, in order to understand it. Same the same level of attention needs to or or more needs to be applied to graphics, and it needs to be approached in a systematic manner. Read the title. Read the axis. Read the explainers read the measure what the definitions of the measurements that are see if the graphic contains a source because if it doesn't contain a source it doesn't disclose the source distrust it all right uh, so yes those several recommendations think about the encodings that are being used and so on and so forth so listening to you describe it i'm a lot more comfortable that there's a robust system in place when i wrote the questions that i sent to you i was thinking wow you've got a good start but I didn't think it went as deep as the x-ray in terms of how you're reading and what you're doing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But, I mean, th 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 it, there is not a single way of reading a chart. For example, the, the way that I read charts is I usually begin with the title of the chart and then I go directly to the chart without even looking at the axis. I read the axis on a third stage, right? Because mm -hmm. first of all, I want to get a sort of like, a, I, I am both a textual person and a visual person. I, there is, I, I, I get some enjoyment. At, at just looking at the sheer representation of data, I like forms, right? So I tend to read the read the title to see what the graphic is about, go directly to the forms, to the shapes, to the shape of the data, and then I read the axis, the source, and so on and so forth. 
but that's just my method. It, it's completely appropriate to read the graphic from the top to the bottom. There's a title, intro, measurements, legend, axis, source, and then the content of the graphic. That, that's also another appropriate, you know, step-by-step -step process to interpreting a chart correct or a map. Okay, correct. Should there be a single way of doing it or should we have multiple ways? I think that as long as you try to read it all and put it all together in your brain, it doesn't really matter what order you follow. But this is something that should be studied academically, I think, in experiments. Which one of these methods, possible paths to reading a chart may be more effective at decoding the information on a chart? And I don't think that there will be any difference. Well, one of the problems with leaving it up to people to decide how to do the scaffolding and the reading is when you said, people don't see what you design, they see what they see. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's very common, right? And that, that, that's the product of not paying attention. If you notice at the very end of the book, I sort of anticipate ideas in, in the part about Nightingale and stuff. I sort of anticipate ideas that I would like to write more deeply about in the, in the future, which is, you know, the, the power of sort of like um, biases, internal biases. And I've, obviously many people have, wrote or have written about this, beginning with Kahneman and all that stuff, right? It's like the role of cognitive biases and personal bias and biases when we interpret information. And it is important to educate people about this. It's important to learn about all this stuff. But that what worries me is that whenever I read books about biases, and I've read tons of them, and also the academic literature about cognitive biases, is that I have noticed that it, is, it becomes much easier to identify biases in other people rather than identifying them in yourself. And what I try to warn against in How Chats Fly at the very end is that, first of all, you need to become aware of your own biases. And you can only do that through, I would say, mindful meditation, an internal analysis, like looking at yourself, observing yourself whenever you see a graphic. I, I, I think that this is a process that everybody can, can educate themselves into, like being able to observe the rise of your own thoughts, how your mind automatically and unconsciously starts developing opinions about everything without you controlling them. It's, very, it's a weird phenomenon to start being able to do it. So it's like you see a piece of information, you don't get all the details, but automatically your brain starts jumping into conclusions and, 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 and raising and forming opinions based on very imperfect and incomplete information, right? So this is a very human impulse. We just deal every day with incomplete information, we write, and then we jump to conclusions based on our own pre-existing ideas, pre-existing ideology, pre-existing biases. What I find positive or at least uh, promising is that I think that this impulse can be curbed and can be controlled through attention again. The more attention we pay, not only to the graphic that we see, but to what happens inside of our, of our brains when we read a graphic, the better we will, we will become as, as readers of charts or any other piece of information for that matter. Good. Are there specific terms that we need to define for people so they understand it? I mean, I put the ones that... Yes, encoding, for example, which is a very geeky term, but it's a very important one. It's one of the critical ones in data visualization in charts. The principle of encoding or the sort of like what encodings are. Encoding is basically... All right, so long story short, whenever you create a chart, what you are doing is to map information or data onto objects. You have a bunch of numbers, and then you've got quantities, and you map those numbers into onto what, let's say, a bunch of rectangles. And then what you do, what you can do, is to change the height or the length of those rectangles in proportion to the data that you're representing. That property that changes, length or height, that is called the encoding in data visualization. The encoding is not the object, the rectangle. The encoding is the property of the object that changes in relationship to the data that you're representing. I mean, it's very important to understand this because it's, it's part of the grammar of graphics, part of, the, of understanding how our, our graphic work, our chart works. There are many other encodings. Position, for example, the position of dots over an axis. The area of an object. We often see maps there in which we see a bunch of bubbles on top of the map and then the size of those bubbles changes. The encoding in that case is not the bubbles. The encoding is the area of the bubbles. The area changes. In a pie chart, the encodings are the angle and also the area 
of the of the different segments of the pie chart. So that's a term that is important for people for people to remember because it's one of the keys to understanding the grammar grammar of charts. So encoding convert to a coded form, um, convert information into a particular form, and it's taking the data, putting it into the rectangles, and describing what that is. No, the encoding is the property. All right, so you get you have the data. You have the objects that you want to use to represent your data, then, which in, in a case of a bar graph is a bunch of rectangles. But then what happens in a bar graph is that the length or the height of those rectangles change in, change in proportion to the data. In that case, what we, we say in data visualization is that the encoding is the length or the height of the rectangle, right? The property that changes in proportion to the data, that's the encoding. The property that changes. The property that changes. The visual property or the spatial property of the objects that change changes, that's the encoding. The object itself is usually called a geom for geometric object, right? The geometric objects that we usually use in charts are rectangles, circles, triangles, lines, points. Those are called the geoms, right? Mm -hmm. The geoms are the objects. The encodings are the property of properties of the geoms that change in proportion to the data or in relationship to the data. Beautiful. That's the essence of the grammar of charts. I will try and put that put that in there. Just yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things we're dealing with in medicine is that data presentation has gotten sophisticated, so people will sell differences. Um, to bring similar drugs or even though they don't have noticeable diff um, even though the, the differences aren't valuable mm -hmm. they're significant statistically so significant but not really significant right you, you could put something in a computer program and say give me what's significant and say this drug is better because this was significant or different mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and we're struggling with how to deal with that because we said I <laughs> I, I, I covered that a little bit in my previous book, The Truthful Art. Even now, I'm not a, a statistician or a biostatistician or, or a scientist or whatever, but, you know, the way that I put it as a, as a layman was, you know, there is a difference between statistically, statistical, something that is statistically significant and properly significant. So whenever, whenever you deal with significance, don't focus just on the significance. Focus on the effect size, for example. It's like you need to pair those two things and weigh them and compare them to each other, right? It's like, what is the effect? I mean, something maybe statistically significant, but then the effect may be an improvement of 0.05% uh, when you compare two treatments. It's like, and that is, is that meaningful? It's like, I don't know. So what I usually say is that, again, I'm not an analyst, but the warnings that I give um, journalists whenever I warn them about all these issues when they cover scientific papers is that, first of all, talk to experts, obviously, to as many experts as possible to get uh, their takes about the paper that you're writing about. But at the same time, as, as a lay person, you also need to develop this sense of asking yourself, well, yeah, statistical uh, significance in the statistical sense is just a mathematical calculation. It tells you very little about the actual significance in the common ten, in the common sense of the word that that treatment may have and that's a more qualitative judgment rather than a quantitative judgment therefore in all these judgments there needs to be a qualitative component and a qualitative component that speak to each other and that may reinforce each other or undermine each other because the qualitative part may undermine the mathematical part the quantitative part of them right but again i'm not qualified to talk about any of these issues in a sort of like in a, in, a, in a meaningful way or in an informed way. But I'm going to push you a little bit more because when you talk about the qualitative changes or uncertainty, mm -hmm. that's where people are going to step in and say, we need a visual to explain it because we don't understand it fully. Mm -hmm. But if you don't understand it fully, how do you create a visual to explain it? And it gives people... It's, uh, it's, yeah, it's the snake that bites his own tail, right? It's like, where do you, be, do you even begin, right? I have not, so uncertainty is one of the things that I have been struggling with for the past two or three years, and I may even write a book about it in, in the future. The whole concept of uncertainty, both, let's say, mathematical uncertainty and non-mathematical uncertainty, like epistemic and sort of like philosophical uncertainty, and then how to display it. Uh, not only how to display it, how to explain it. 
So there is something that is sort of hinting how charts lie, which is that charts on their own are rarely useful. They are only useful when you pair them with an argument, with a textual or verbal argument. That's when they become useful. The textual or verbal argument on, on its own, it's usually not great or not useful enough. The chart on its own is not useful enough, but when you pair the two things together, that's when understanding can happen. And that's one of the reasons why, for example, in the chapter about uncertainty and how chats lie, I spend so much time with the cone of uncertainty, with the hurricane cone of uncertainty. Because one of the conclusions that I have reached throughout the years is that the problem is not the map itself. The map is fine if you know how to read it. But that's the key thing. If you know how to read it, and if you know what it truly shows, in order to know that, someone needs to explain it to you, verbally or textually. That's what, and I called the, I wrote recently a, an article for a, for a journal about these, uh, sort of like a tentative exploratory paper about what I think that is the key component in making all these sort of very complex graphics understandable, which is a mediator or an intermediary, a person who shows you the graphic but doesn't just show you the graphic. He or she also teaches you how to read the graphic, teaches you what the graphic is showing, explains to you what that uncertainty means and where it comes from, how it was calculated, what the implications are, and so on and so forth. That's when the graphic may become meaningful and understandable, when you have that sort of explanation. So that may be true also in the case of any other source of uncertainty. So just don't just show the graphic. Spend time explaining what the graphic is actually showing and what the graphic is actually not showing, because you can sort of anticipate sometimes what possible misunderstandings that graphic may elicit or may lead people to. So just to share, growing up in Florida, my father worked for FPNL. He was mm -hmm. a subcontractor, and his job was to get the hurricane maps to the people. Yeah, but nope. again, the maps themselves, the maps on their own, yeah, they they say very little. We we conduct as many focus groups recently here at the university, showing common people the the, the cone of uncertainty, the uh, estimated time of arrival map, the uh, probability of experiencing hurricane winds, and so on and so forth. These are all products that the National Hurricane Center produces. But the challenge is that all these maps were not made for the general public. No. They were made for decision makers, for risk assessment managers, for people like your dad, decision makers. The problem is that all these maps now are in the open because anybody can access them, even ignorant journalists who sometimes explain these maps wrong on TV. As I, I still remember, I don't think that I mentioned this in, in How Chats Live, but I have this anecdote that I often share in talks that uh, two or three years ago during Irma, I was watching TV during Irma, and if you remember, Irma was originally predicted to go over Miami, but then one or two days before it landed, the cone switched to the West Coast, and it ended, it ended over, going over Naples. Well, when, when the cone moved suddenly to the West Coast, I remember watching TV and a TV newscaster saying, well, it seems that Miami is going to be fine because we are far from the center of the cone. I said, no, my God, that's not how to read the map. That's not how to read the map. It's like that, that sort of like that intervention is actually what explains the misinterpretation. That's an intervention. <laughs> I mean, it explains why people make, it, make the wrong inferences is because you're explaining it wrong. If you explain it right, then people will be able to read the map. Yeah. So I guess the last question I have for you is about your future and your future writing and your future with graphics. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Do you think you're going to go deeper with information sharing or do you think you're going to go wider? I'm going to do both. So I already, I already have a contract for my next book, which I will probably write um, in the, this year to be published in 2021. And this book is going to be about, it's mostly going to be for designers, for people who already do or who think about, think about graphics. And it's going to be much focus, focused on moral reasoning, on, on ethical reasoning, how to make good decisions, uh, ethical decisions, when you're going to create a visualization. So it's going to discuss a little bit about you know, the quality of the data, looking into whether the data is representing what you claim that it is representing, but they're much more focused on the graphics, graphic display of that information. So which encodings you should use, how to display, how to show the data, and so on and so forth. 
and talking a little bit about the, the literature in, in ethics and ethical thinking, so different schools in ethical thinking and how they can be applied to the design of visualization. So that's my next project. That's going to be this year to be published in 2021. And then I have a couple of ideas for a more general public books, similar to how chats lie, but those will probably come around 2022, 2023. Again, I would like to write about uncertainty, the whole idea of, uh, of uncertainty, how to explain it, how to embrace it, how people, how people from different sort of like philosophical uh, backgrounds uh, approach it differently. So, you know, explaining what a Bayesian is, explaining what a frequentist is, and so on and so forth, and what that all, that, that all means in a language that a common person like myself can understand. And then with a chapter or a few chapters or even half of the book about how to display it and how to interpret it visually. So that's another project that is vaguely sort of like bubbling inside my, inside my mind. And then I have another idea, which I still need to shape a little bit better before I can talk about it. Um, but it's sort of like connected to the ecological fallacy and, and Simpson's paradox. So expanding a little bit on that. I think that there's a book in there to be written. Whose paradox? Simpson's paradox. Okay. Simpson's paradox, yeah. That's called an amalgamation paradox. That's in chapter, one of the last few chapters of How Chats Lie, I describe it very briefly. Yeah. I'll have to go back, sorry. <laughs> no, no problem, yeah. So Simpson's paradox is basically when you see, there's the exam this example in How Chats Lie, in which I show a, 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 a scatter plot showing Cigarette consumption per capita yes. life expectancy. Yep, and how All right, so that's an example of Simpson's paradox because once you start disaggregating the data and you go down to the individual level, the, <laughs> the pattern is the opposite. It's like the more you smoke, the shorter you live, right? So Simpson's paradox is basically says that a pattern that you may see at a certain level of aggregation of data may disappear or even reverse at a completely different level of aggregation of that same data. And this leads to tons of confusion. And misunderstandings, and I think that there is an entire book to be written about this type of this set of phenomena because it's not just one. There are many interconnected phenomena that relate to the whole idea of this sort of aggregation paradox or amalgamation paradox. So I will probably write about that two, three years down the road. Yeah. We know that people who have HIV will never get sarcoidosis, so HIV is protective. And if you're a sarcoid community, it's like we all need to get HIV. I have. I published another example, which was very funny uh, in, in Scientific American recently, which is very similar, is obesity rates versus life expectancy. There's yes. a positive, very strong positive association. That's obviously, there's an, under, so this is an example, obviously, of correlation is not causation. But again, we need to go way beyond that. It's not just that correlation doesn't equal causation. It's also a Simpsons paradox, an amalgamation paradox, because you're looking at the wrong level of aggregation. What you want to learn about is not whether there is a positive association between obesity and life expectancy at the national level. What you want to learn about is whether being obese is good for you. That's what you want to learn about. And looking at the data aggregated at the national level is completely meaningless. It may be meaningful for other purposes, but not to learn about yourself, right? And that was the Cook County, Miami, um, Houston map. Oh, which one was that? Which is the most obese area? Oh, yeah, yeah, the most of this area in the, in the United States. It depends on how you look at it, right? Whether you look at race, whether you look at, at, at absolute numbers and things like that, yeah, yeah. So what else do you want people to know about um, graphics and expressing data visually? Well, I, I would like people to embrace graphics. I, I, feel that, I feel that many people are a little bit afraid of making visualizations, um, either because they feel that visualizations are hard to design or because they believe that visualizations are a lesser form of communication in comparison to writing or to speaking, particularly written language. And I think that both things are wrong. So I, I would like to address the, the latter first. Visualization is as powerful as written language. In, it can be more powerful than written language, depending on the context. So what I would like people to start embracing is the idea that different types of stories, different types of messages, may be better conveyed sometimes through text, sometimes through visuals. And your role as a communicator is to decide which kind of 
device, which kind of language should you use written language, should you use digital language, which kind of language you should use, depending on the on the information that you want to convey. Sometimes the right the graphic is the right solution. Sometimes it's the text that is the right solution. Sometimes it's a combination of both. But a visualization is never sort of like a complementary object to the text. It may be the other way around. The text may be complementary to the image. It depends on the story. So people need to develop this sense that visual communication is extremely powerful, very persuasive, and also equally sort of, so to speak, um, how would I say this, intellectually sophisticated as text, if not more. It requires a deep knowledge of visual grammar and understanding of how the human brain works when we deal with visual information. So it's not a lesser form of communication in comparison to text. And we should, we should not forget, I am also a writer, so I do believe in words, I do believe in writing. But we should never dismiss visualization as a lesser form of communication. And then we also need to overcome this hurdle that many people, this sort of like mental block that many people have, saying, oh, this, but, but this looks so complicated. How am I going to learn how to design a good map or design a good graph? Well, the same way that you learn how to write. It's, it's very similar. So I teach an intro to visualization course every year at the University of Miami, and it has become an extremely popular course. It began with having just one section, and now we are teaching five sections of that course, myself and another, and another professor, with the students coming from all over the university, communications, engineering, business analytics, computer science. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a course about how to communicate with charts. And we have basically proved that what I have just said is right. Anybody can learn. Anybody can learn. As long as you learn some very, very elementary and easy to understand principles, you learn the tools, and then you learn to connect the two things, the principles and the tools, one month or two months into the course, everybody in that course is, is able to produce professional uh, level, uh, quality level graphics. And by the end of the semester, all of them, all the students, regardless of their background, are able to produce beautiful, clear, deep information graphics. So anybody can learn. Great. I have to put that back up higher up in the interview. <laughs> but you give me some good information. It's a very valuable topic. And I think, I think it's worthwhile. Okay. I appreciate it. Yeah. Well, keep me posted. Uh, if you need to, three to four months after I write it that it goes in. I, I, I'm not in a rush. Let's keep me posted whenever it is ready. If you need any more any feedback or any input from me or any help, just let me know. I'm usually around. Sounds great. Okay, well, nice talking to you. Nice talking to you too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.